Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to this beautiful room in Moses Lake. Um, I think we had such a successful day yesterday, um, and I want to talk more about that later. But first, we are going to do roll call. And additionally, I want um, the record to reflect that yesterday um, all governors were present, uh, with the exception of Tom Ahern. Um, so right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Executive Director to do roll call. Thank you. All right. When I call your name, please indicate that you are present. Christina Larry. Present. Brent Williams Ruth. Present. Allison Whitney. Here. Mary Rathbone. Serena Sayani. Present. Kari Petrosic. Present. Jordan Couch. Present. Matthew Dresden. Here. Nam Nguyen. Here. Francis Adewale. Here. Kevin Fay. Here. Tom Ahern. Not present. All right, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Executive Director. And, and um, as I was saying yesterday, I think we had an amazing day in spite of nature's glitches. Um, I really, really want to thank a number of people, however, um, for really making sure that the day went ahead in spite of the odds. Um, so to Executive Director Nevitt, who always keeps her calm, and her amazing staff, Shelly and Aziza, what, what an amazing job, you really pulled it together. And to the comms team, to Sarah and Jen, who fielded my, my anxious phone calls about trying to get it right, um, I, think, I think we pulled it off, I think it went really well. But more importantly, I really hope that all of us who came out of the meeting um, really came out with an appreciation and understanding of what the tribal leaders and practitioners were saying. And I hope we can all, as we move forward this year, reflect on what we can do to support our tribal leaders and practitioners across the state, really. Executive Director Nevitt and I were talking um, after the meeting about some of the requests made by the tribal practitioners, and we're very interested in exploring um, ways in which we can make some of those requests come true. So if anyone is interested in that effort, please let us know um, because we will be working on it this year. Um, so today, uh, as, as Executive Director said, it's the Hanada Garcia Show. Our, um, our Chief Regulatory Counsel is going to be presenting um, on the topic of a number of proposed amendments to WISBA bylaws. So I am going to turn it over to you, Hanada, and thank you so much for all your work. All right. Bon dia, good morning. Um, not a show, <laughs> and I won't be alone. Um, I have uh, Bobby Henry, Associate Director for Regulatory Services Department, joining online. Um, uh, Doug will also co-present one of the proposals, as well as Kate Schur, um, Assistant General Counsel. So to get started, uh, so we have six items on the agenda and uh, hopefully an opportunity to take a break um, in a couple of hours. I'll do my best not to get too, you know, down to the weeds. Um, and I guess if you want to refer to your materials, starting on page 189, we're going to start with the resident agent requirement that we talked about at the last meeting. So as a reminder, the resident agent requirement applies to members whose address of record is not in Washington State or is in Washington State, but is not a physical street address. So those members are currently required to designate a resident agent for the purpose of receiving service of process. So this requirement, as I talked at the last meeting, has been around for a long time. We believe it's outdated, not very helpful, and it's definitely not a popular requirement and a very difficult one to enforce. We have about 3,500 members who are not compliant right now. 
So as a quick recap, at the last BOG meeting, uh, the BOG approved suggested amendments to the APR and the ELC to remove the resident agent requirement. Those suggested amendments are now before the court. The board also reviewed for the first time bylaw amendments that would remove the resident agent requirement, which are needed to conform with the amendments to the APR. So we are gonna go and present right now the bylaw amendments for the second read in action today. Um, one option that you have, well, first, let me go back here. So if you look at this slide here, um, after the meeting, we decided to send a survey to all of the out of state members and get their input on the resident nation requirement and the voting issue that comes with that. So out of the 7,500 members, uh, we received a response from 373. And as you can see here, 78% of the respondents, they felt that was either important or extremely important to them to remove the resident agent requirement. So to me, this really confirms the BOG's decision at the last meeting, right? It's very much aligns with member sentiment on this issue. At the last meeting, there was also a concern that the public would be impacted by the lack of access to that information, right, to that resident agent. Um, at the time, I mentioned that this information is ra rarely, hardly ever requested. But we did look into whether this um, register agent, more broadly speaking, whether it's required for lawyers under any other laws or regulations especially as it relates to operating a business in Washington state. And what we found is that corporations, nonprofits, and limited partnerships are indeed required to designate and maintain a registered agent in the state. Although sole proprietorships don't appear to be required to do that, um, when they apply for a business license, they need to disclose a mailing and physical address for the business and that's all available to the public on the Washington State Department of Revenue Business Lookup website. So here I'm gonna uh, show you all the bylaw references that we are asking you today to take action to eliminate. So there are one, two, three, four, um, and then we have the voting issue. Right, so since the last reference re refers to voting, um, one option you have right now is to take action on this before you for second read right now, or you can postpone action until we have the discussion, the voting discussion, which is gonna happen right after this. It's on the agenda for right after this. So I'm open to questions. Um, we have several options for you to consider regarding voting, and that's gonna be presented um, after this. Are there any questions or comments? Or a motion to approve the bylaw amendments? Or a motion to approve the bylaw amendments? Governor Couch. I move to approve the bylaw amendment. So it's moved and seconded. Any discussion? We will proceed to a vote. This is a motion to approve the uh, bylaw amendment as presented. Christina Larry? Aye. Brent Williams Ruth? Aye. Allison Whitney? Uh, yes. Mary Rathbun? Yes, and present. Serena <laughs> Sayani? Yes. Kari Petrosik? Yes. Jordan Couch? Aye. Matthew Dresden? Aye. Nam Nguyen? Aye. Francis Adewale? Aye. Kevin Fay? Aye. Have I missed anyone? Motion passes unanimously. Great. <clears throat> um, and, and now we proceed. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you, Chief Garcia. All right. Um, so right now we can talk about the out-of-state um, 
voting options, right? So for this issue, I collaborated with Catherine Schur, Assistant General Counsel, our new policy counsel for the Bar Association. So uh, she's joining online, I believe, and is going to co-present with me. I also want to recognize Paris and Bobby who worked to help um, on this project. So please, you know, if you're online, uh, Paris as well, feel free to jump in. If you want to refer to your materials, um, starting on page 202. So in this presentation, we are going to talk about representation, right? Um, as a kind of a shorthand, but what we are really talking about is how to create a system that gives out-of-state members the appropriate opportunities to express a preference for the candidates, right, that they think are going to best represent their interests on the board. So while we currently have members residing out of state and public members who do not have a designated seat on the Board of Governors, at the end of the day, every governor, right, as you can see here in the bylaws, is expected to act in the best interests of all members and the public. So I thought it would be helpful to highlight what's in place right now for out-of-state uh, members. All active members, including out-of-state members, may vote in at-large uh, elections. Um, members residing out-of-state can also vote in the district of their primary practice if they are practicing in Washington State. So what's really changing here, what we need to focus on is their ability to vote in the district of the address of the resident agent, right? Since, since we are eliminating the requirement, what does that mean uh, now? What other options they may have? So as we explored you know, options to bring to you today, uh, we thought that would be helpful, once again, to ask input from members to find out how they feel about the voting issue. And as I mentioned, 373 responses. And as you can see here, with respect to elections, the responses indicate that out-of-state members are not significantly engaged with elections currently, um, with only 19% of them indicating that they have ever voted in a bog election. At the same time, 46% of respondents stated that voting in a bog election is important to them. And only 21% 20, indicated that they were aware that they could vote in the district of their resident agent. And only 8% were aware they could request to vote in the district of their primary practice within Washington state. So to me, this highlights you know, a couple of things, including the need to engage in outreach, right? And, Regardless of any potential change, I think there is room for us to uh, do some more outreach to explain to other state members what their current ability and future uh, based on the BOGS decision moving forward. So I'm going to pass on to Kate here pretty soon, but I just want you to know that um, this process is being well received by members, and I think you should know that. Um, certainly, removing the resident agent requirement is a welcomed change. I think it's, be, it's being cheered by a lot of people. Um, I also wanna share some very specific uh, comments that members uh, provided here. And, you know, they are gratitude comments highlighting that they appreciate being asked for the input, right? And some were actually very pleasantly surprised that they would have been given this opportunity. So the, the reason I wanted to share this is because I think no matter what the outcome is of this discussion and what the BOG decides on moving, moving forward for out-of-state voting options, I think one thing is very clear right now, and that is that this has been a very thoughtful process, um, and I think it's, it's been appreciated by members, and it'd be easier to convey the decision knowing that their input was, uh, was sought. So thank you so much for, for engaging in this process um, and I'll pass it on to Kay right now. All right, thank you. 
So in developing the options that we've presented to you, uh, one of the things that we did is we also looked at uh, how other state bars handle out-of-state voting um, for their members. In reviewing those states, you'll see in the column on the left um, that most of the state bars maintain some sort of residency requirement uh, in order for any of their members to vote. Um, so in most of those uh, states, out-of-state members are not going to be voting in any of the govern governing elections. There are a couple of states, however, that did have some provisions um, to allow out-of-state members to participate in elections. Uh, there were a couple of districts, Arizona, Missouri, and Nebraska, that allowed their out-of-state members to vote in the district where they most recently resided or practiced prior to moving out of state. Next, there were a couple of states that did have a de designated out-of-state governor um, that were solely elected by out-of-state uh, members. Those are New Hampshire, Oregon, and New Mexico. And then lastly, in the column on the right, there are a couple of states that structure their bar governance as a large, almost legislative governing body. Um, and in those states, some of them did include a representative for out-of-state members, um, Georgia, South Carolina, and Wisconsin. Those are voting members. In Texas, that's a non-voting liaison. So I'm gonna go through the options that we presented in the memo that was in your materials. Um, there's quite a bit more detail in the memo, so I'm just going to give kind of a high level overview of what the options are and then talk about some of the primary advantages or disadvantages um, to each of those uh, options that we've presented. So the first option uh, would be to permit out-of-state members to vote solely in at-large governor elections. This would just eliminate um, the ability of out-of-state members to vote based on uh, their uh, current uh, registered agent or the primary area of practice. Um, so the benefits here is, again, this would be relatively simple to administer. Um, there really would not be any additional requirements that members would have to go through in order to get a ballot. Um, the primary disadvantage to this and a significant disadvantage would be that uh, it reduces opportunities for out-of-state bar members to participate in additional elections. They would just get that one uh, at-large governor election to participate in instead of a second uh, district-based election. All right, under option two, out-of-state members would be allowed to voluntarily designate a registered agent, excuse me, a resident agent uh, for voting purposes only. Um, so this assumes that they would not be doing a, a res resident agent for the court or for other bar purposes. Uh, the benefit of this is that it is a clear mechanism that would allow out-of-state members to vote in a district election. Um, I do think there are significant disadvantages that come with this particular option, though. The primary one being that our out-of-state members have told us that they have a strong preference for not having a resident agent. So this would reintroduce all of the administrative burdens and costs for members that uh, you are attempting to eliminate in addition, it would mean that somebody could designate a resident agent in any district of their choice. Uh, the out-of-state member would not have to have any sort of connection to that district beyond the resident agent. Um, and in addition, because of the changes in the rules and the voluntary nature of designating the resident agent, it would likely require significant outreach to members to let them know about the change and how they might go about voting. In option three, a, an out-of-state member, when they inform the bar that they no longer have an in-state address, would get randomly assigned to one of the districts. Uh, like the other options, this would be pretty easy to administer and, again, doesn't require any additional action from members to receive that ballot. But like some of the other options, um, this would not uh, maintain any sort of meaningful connection to the district for the member, which might lead to them feeling um, less represented or just not having an interest in the events that are happening in that district and could possibly uh, discourage participation. For option four, we would permit out-of-state members to vote both in those at-large governor elections and then uh, in the district of their primary practice. So currently, uh, as Hanada covered, 
uh, for members to vote in the district of their primary practice, they have to affirmatively reach out to the bar and inform the bar that that is how they want to vote in the upcoming election. Under this option, we would simplify that process and make it much more automated. So out-of-state members, when they go to relicense annually, would have the option to um, indicate whether they continue to practice in Washington and then designate the area, the district that they primarily practice in. So the advantages here, um, one, again, it's going to be relatively easy to administer. It's not significantly uh, different than what we currently do. It also allows for some of that regional connection and representation, um, which could increase participation. In addition, I also would anticipate that uh, automating this process would mean that um, more people would be inclined to participate because they're not having to jump through any administrative hoops uh, in order to get that ballot sent to them by email. Um, one of the disadvantages of this, though, is that out-of-state members who don't maintain a primary practice win within Washington would only be voting for their, those at-large governors. They would still um, have their representation through at-large governors, but again, this would be reducing their um, ability to express a preference for a second candidate. All right, option five, this would add a Board of Governors seat uh, solely for out-of-state members. The um, seat would be reserved for somebody who resides out of state themselves, and they would just be elected by our out-of-state members. Um, this is a very clear way to provide representation for those out-of-state members. Um, a couple of the downsides, however, is that uh, it likely would increase the um, cost to the bar of board activities, um, and that cost could potentially be significant depending on where this um, governor resides. In addition, as, you know, as we saw, um, out-of-state members are not significantly engaged with bar activities, uh, so it potentially could be challenging to recruit candidates for this position, and then uh, it also could be difficult for that uh, governor, once they're seated, to engage with their constituents in a meaningful way because of how dispersed uh, their constituents are going to be. I'll also add, to um, that there are some uh, potential for this to decrease efficiency of the board just by having an additional board member. Um, but as it's only adding one seat, um, that's probably a minimal uh, challenge. And then lastly, uh, this option would convert one of the current at-large governor positions to an at-large governor uh, that is dedicated solely to out-of-state members. So this comes with some of the benefits of the prior option where it would provide a clear method for representation for those out-of-state bar members. Um, and it also doesn't have some of those uh, issues or problems that are associated with increasing the size of the board. However, we don't recommend this option um, because currently our at-large governor positions are intended to increase um, representation and the voices of typically underrepresented communities and attorneys, um, bar members. Uh, and so the loss of one of those positions would mean decreasing that voice on the board. All right, so we presented a number of options, um, but it, to assist the board, we've identified two options that we do think are going to be the most viable to pursue and have um, presented uh, suggested bylaw amendments with those. So if the board would like to move forward with either of those. Um, those are available for a first read today. The two options that we've identified are option four, which would, again, that's permitting out-of-state members um, to vote in the at-large elections and to designate their primary uh, district of practice and identify uh, and vote in that election. And then option five would be to add that seat for an out-of-state uh, member. All right, so we're happy to uh, answer any questions about those, um, and we hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Schur, and I do invite questions, comments from my fellow governors. Governor Couch, and then um, 
Uh, Governor Villeneuve. Uh, yeah, so with voting already being such a low priority thing for members, I'm curious if we go through the avenue of allowing them to designate a um, like primary area of practice. Can it also just be a requirement to just get them signed up? I'm just thinking of, you know, uh, opt out or yeah, opt out is a lot better for them than opt in in these circumstances. And so if we can make that a little more pressured, I think that might be useful. In the future, yes. <laughs> Governor Villeneuve. So I elect. I think this is great. Just wanted to put a comment. Uh, Amazon, for example, has 900 lawyers, uh, and they are located in uh, the Seven South District. And I know they're very. Uh, they love you know Amazon, the location, um, and I think option four, for example, is probably something that they would uh, they would prefer and like. Um, in regards to the mindset of, of having a present where their, uh, their headquarters is. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, 50% of lawyers at Amazon were to some extent out of state. Hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts? So in terms of process, uh, Kate, would you suggest that we sort of officially say we're going to have a first read on one of the topics if this is what the board is interested in? I think if the board is leaning towards one of those options over the other, then uh, yes, that's the purpose um, of including those suggested amendments. So you can proceed now. So I am definitely a fan of number four. Uh, do we need then a motion or do we just need to say like we'd like to see this up as a, a second read later okay great so i would love to see number four as a second read governor sayani um i guess i just want to understand as i agree that i'm a fan of four over five but i just want to understand why we would be giving them the option to select a district of their primary practice and by district i mean like our geographical district correct I guess if they don't Correct. live in the state, I'm not sure why that they would have a right to vote in the state for which they don't live. I think it makes sense that they could be an at-large vote, but they don't live in the area for which we're all responsible for the lawyers that live within our district. So I'm not sure if I understand the genesis of that, if I could get more explanation. Sure. I'm going to go to um, Governor Williams Ruth, unless um, maybe our chief regulatory counsel wants to address that question. Yeah, so I just want to clarify, this option is currently available. Um, it's just not something people take advantage of because I don't think it's clear to them. I think one of the benefits is because you're giving them an opportunity to engage, you know, they have some interests in that community, right? Because they have a practice, uh, they have clients. Um, so, so I think that's the rationale behind it is to give them an opportunity since they have some interests in the location. Thank you, Governor Williams-Ruth, and then uh, Director Nevitt. Thank you. So, you know, as listening to the presentation, there's a couple of things that strike me, which may be a little off topic, but yet at the same time, we don't ever really seem to be on topic to address them. And that is the fact that we heard that, you know, each governor is not responsible for a district which great, that's fantastic. But we also have fiscal policies that then limit the activities of governors to their district. So I find that, you know, when we're having these conversations, we're actually not, you know, that they're self-serving to the end results. I mean, we don't want governors to be able to go anywhere around the state to attend things and, and you know, like if the Spokane bar wanted to put on something and, you know, Allison wanted to come from Vancouver, that's like, oh no, that's not your district. But yet she's supposed to also then care about all those constituents. So I find that when we're having these conversations, it really does feel that we're serving the individual objective and not trying to really create the cohesive WSBA. And as it relates to this, I, I you know, to, to relegate out of state members to specifically just the at large, fine. But then what are we actually going to do? Because during my time on the board, I have not seen any concerted effort. And as I have now been in at-large governor for two years, 
there's been no real effort to connect with those people. And so the fact that we had the numbers that we did from the survey of people saying it was important, imagine how those people might feel if we actually tried and, and did something more to specifically connect and target with them as members of our association. So, you know, wherever we go, whatever the board would like to do, it's fine. But I also think that, you know, we're taking the, the license fees, not dues, license fees from individuals that really don't have a voice. And in my first year um, on the board, and I don't believe since then, we actually did have somebody from out of state, a colonel at the United States Air Force Academy that wanted to, that went for the at-large position. And other than that, I can't think of others that, and, and unfortunately, in my own opinion, despite our efforts to put her on the, the foundation board and engage and try and make this person who has so many vast resources, connections, contacts, ideas, experiences that weren't at the table, it was wasted. And now she's done with her time with the, the foundation and is no longer really actively participating in the WSBA. So as we move forward, I just would like us to think, and again, especially in light of yesterday, in the identification that in the years of our organization's existence, that that was the first time that we'd had a direct contact and meeting with the 29 tribes in the state of Washington. I would just like us to do better, whatever our result is. Okay. Um, I was just gonna add to the response to Serena's question um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if someone doesn't have any connections in the state, isn't practicing in the state, so they're not living in the state and they're not practicing in the state, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of this, right? They can't just pick a district. And then also, I think part of it too is thinking about, um, you know, folks who might live in Oregon, but practice in Clark County or folks who might live in Idaho, but practice in Spokane. So uh, that's sort of how I imagine this would largely be used or perhaps um, as was suggested early, folks who maybe are working in a hybrid way, but you know, their place of primary practice mm -hmm. is in the state. Thank you, Director Nevitt. Um, oh, and our, hang on, um, General Counsel um, Lori Powers and then Governor Fay. I, I just wanted to just make a comment about this out of state. You know, that number, which is 7,000 some out of 40, it, it's a significant number. And I just, to keep in mind, I think that's going to be increasing, right? Because more and more people are working sorry, more and more people are working remotely in hybrid. So I, I don't think, I think this is going to be a growing issue that we're going to have to talk about later on if we don't do something with it today. So, Governor Fay. Um, I want, I'll speak uh, from experience on the uh, corporate practice committee. There are a lot of lawyers who want to maintain their bar card in Washington because once they're done with their rotation in wherever Microsoft or Boeing sends them for two years, they don't want to have to reapply. Um, so these people, you know, if you're paying the 500 bucks a year to keep your bar card, well, you probably have something to do with Washington. And golly, I think those people should be represented. Because right now it's, it's, it's a significant portion of our 40,000 members. President-elect Adewale. Uh, option four, it's important to those of us that live in border towns. And that is, option four is important to those of us that live in border towns. Um, if you have ever attended meetings of the bar in Vancouver or in uh, Spokane, you see a lot of members uh, that are out of state, quote and unquote, but they are just, you know, two or three city blocks away from, from this state. 
and there is a large majority of them that have uh, that practice in both jurisdictions. In fact, our past president Kyle Shusheti, who is sitting in the room, um, practice in both states. He could be out of state in Oregon at any point in time, or out of state in Washington at any point in time. And we all experience that. And I think that is the reason for them to be able to indicate where they want to vote. They understand the issues in those districts. They know what is going on in those border towns and what challenges attorneys face in those areas. So uh, that's why option four is for me. Thank you. So this is a first read. Um, if option four is the option to be considered, I would ask now if anyone has any specific feedback about the bylaw changes as presented. Yes, of course. So Jordan left the room, but he had said early on, um, he was wondering if we could make it a requirement. And I, I didn't entirely understand, but maybe did you all have a response to that? Yeah, so the idea is to put something in the license renewal. So it's being very, you know, available to people, the option to designate someone, right? So they don't have to affirmatively look for that option. It will be presented to them. So it would require some uh, technical changes to our systems right now. Governor Fay. Um, if I'm keeping my bar card up, even though I'm currently living in New York, I don't have a primary practice in Washington. How do I answer that? Um, the corporate headquarters? Well, there's offices all across the state, depending on who you work with. I don't think that's, it's an additional burden on these members um, that they may take the wrong way because a lot of them are going to be, have to answer, I don't have one. What happens to them? Um, conversely, um, if you don't have a, if you get, maybe they just pick one and they can affect the vote in uh, any district they choose at random. And that doesn't seem right either. Governor Adewale. I, I, can she go first? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry, Allison. Governor Whidbey, I did not see her. So my understanding is it would be like an honor system of mm -hmm. where you, how would we regulate that at all? I mean, just to what uh, Governor Fay was saying, we don't want, I don't want to. <laughs> We heard that, so, Governor. So that, was, <laughs> yeah. so that was my question. Like, how are we going to actually regulate this if it becomes an issue? It would be on our system, but we always have the ability to run reports or, you know, engage in inquiries and get more information if there is reason to believe that someone is misrepresenting what they practice or trying to take advantage or changing districts, right, like for every election. So I think... There are some mechanisms we can adopt, um, but I think unless we are noticing <clears throat> a, a significant change or have a, some reason to believe it's being misused, we probably wouldn't take any any action. A lot of our systems are, you know, based on the honor system. So. Okay, uh, Governor uh, President Elect Adewale. Sorry. I, I'm going by my own experience in my two elections as governors. Um, I requested for all the voters in my district, and I discovered that a large majority of the voters in my district were living out of state. I cannot win an election without them. 
So I wrote letters and emails to all of the ones that have emails and the ones that only have mailing address. I wrote letters to all of them, telling them about my ideas uh, as District 5 governors and everything. And I got a lot of responses back. And some of them are in the military. Some of them are just out of state in Idaho. And they responded back with information, with equal information about. The practice of law is no longer local. Let's be very real. It's no, we, we are looking at 1960s practice of law. Law has changed remarkably. The criminal law that we thought is going to be all local is not. The decision by the Supreme Court in D.C. is affecting homeless, uh, homeless uh, uh, um, and houseless folks in Spokane, in Bend, Oregon. So we have to get away from the idea that there is going to be, you know, all politics are local and these issues are... Uh, w people that are willing to do, invest effort in finding information about, their, about the localities they want to vote in should be allowed to be able to check that box and vote in that district. Now, I'm concerned about the how to, uh, about asking people to vote and pushing people into at like that's why no option number five is not really my option at all. Uh, but if people want to indicate I, that currently uh, at large voting is statewide, you know, is everyone can vote at large. And so why would I, I mean, if, if someone wants to indicate, I want to be able to vote for South, uh, South 7 or whatever that district is, or the district 5, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, if, if I want to vote in that district, if, if I'm living out of say, I want to vote, let, give me an option to be able to give the options to the voter. Don't say you are not your administrative cost or whatever should not factor in. This is how democracy works. Sometimes is you have to pay a price, like Governor Williams Root always reminds us. There is a price for everything. If you want order, if you want justice, you have to be willing to pay for it. We have to understand that that administrative expense we have to be willing to bear, and I and, and in this case is very minimal. And if members that want to vote in any district need to indicate that preference, let give them that option. Don't take it away from them. That's my two cents. Chief Disciplinary Counsel Doug Ende. Uh, I want to be clear about why this cannot be a requirement, and it bears on Governor Whitney's question and Governor Faye's observation. Uh, we are asking these individuals, these members, to designate a district of primary practice in Washington. And they are expected to tell the truth based on the honor system. Not every out-of-state lawyer has a primary place of practice in Washington. And if you require them to make one up, you are asking them to make a misrepresentation to the Bar Association. We cannot put them in that position. Now, what you could do is establish a default. If you do not have a place of primary practice in Washington, you will be placed in X district. Thank you, Chief um, Disciplinary Counsel and Day. Oh, um, Council Sure. Uh, and I, I just wanted to clarify sort of the practical process that somebody. Um, that we imagine somebody would go through to indicate their primary area of practice for us. So I think first of all, uh, if somebody is entering an address that is out of state, they would simply be asked, do you or don't you maintain a current practice within the state? And then if they answer yes, uh, at that point, they would be designating where, which district they primarily practice in. Um, so somebody who is in New York, um, uh, but just simply engage, does not engage in any practice of law in Washington, they simply could answer, no, I don't maintain a practice uh, within Washington, and th they would move on then with the relicensing or with the um, renewal process. Thank you, Council Sure. And Governor Whitney? So I have another question on that. So 
what if the person is all over the state? So they live out of state in Portland, but they are, you know, in King County and Thurston County and Lewis County and Clark County. I mean, I'm, I don't have a primary practice. I practice in Oregon. I practice in Washington. I'm all over the state. I, I, I technically live in Clark County, but <laughs> I'm saying for people who, you know, live in Idaho and they are all over the state of Washington, how would they decide that? Um, who would like to field that answer, Chief Regulatory Counsel? I, I think one option is to select that you you don't have right a primary practice, and then you would, based on this option four, be limited to at large elections. And uh, President Elect Adewale, uh, and then Governor Fay. My 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 question then is the primary place. Why is the primary place of practice the requirement for voting? Why don't we take that out? So let's think about that and see in the second reading if that is allowed. If, if I said I live in New York, I practice in every county in Washington state, or I live in, you know, Aden, Idaho, and I practice in King County as well as in Clark County and in Spokane County, I indicate all of that. And I still want to vote in a particular district of my choice, should I not be given an opportunity for that? And um, why do we, let's think about that. I, I'm not trying to suggest a particular way of this. When this come back in second reading, I want us to think about what is that. And I want, I would really appreciate if we can send another poll out on this, what would be, that can provide because I like to have input from those people that I, none of the people sitting on this table are impacted by this decision. Oh, that's not true. I I don't I I, I except you are corporate attorney like you, like you. Most of us practice in uh, we will not be impacted by this decision because we already designated where our primary place of practice are. But the voting, the right to vote, the place where you want to vote in the district is determined by where you are currently resident. That is where you live. But we are looking at the practice of law for these folks, and we are saying that they practice all over the place. Should we restrict them to where they practice? If, if I may call our our districts are determined by congressional um, designation. So how do they do it in congressional, in federal congressional ele election? If you are military and you are heart of state, you vote in that district. So these are complexities that I want us to examine in our second reading. I'm not saying that I have a magic bullet, but I think that I want to hear from the people that are gonna be impacted by this decision. Governor Sayani, and then after that, um, Kate Chur from the Office of General Counsel. Governor Faye. Oh, I'm so sorry, Governor Faye. I did not mean to exclude you. I'm invisible. <laughs> I really couldn't see you. Actually. I know. I know. <laughs> it's a little bit of humor. Um, I, I think uh, Chief Disciplinary Counsel Endy uh, made a... a perception, a perceptive idea here, perhaps. Today, you vote on where you live, just as you vote for your congressperson where they live. If you don't live in the state, you don't vote for your congressperson. No, no. But... Yeah, if you're serving overseas... You yes, but you have a home in Washington. No, no, no. Not necessarily. No, no, no. Um, um, a point of order. Oh, sorry, sorry. Can, can we not have crosstalk? Yeah. The, the, we have decided that one congressional district has so many lawyers it has to be cut in two. Um, I think the, the rather than just change the whole system from where you reside, which is how it's been forever, you could change a district. Um, oh to include the out-of-state people. Just have it, you know, redraw the lines. 
And golly, some districts have way, way, way more lawyers than others. So um, I mean, the majority of lawyers are probably what? Not majority, but district seven district. You've got thousands and there are folks who have not so many. So let's just find a place to put them. Pick one. Governor Sayani. Thank you. Uh, Francis, I was fully on board with everything you said. <laughs> oh, <dear>. Until. Until <laughs> you came up with the idea that it shouldn't matter where you live. And I guess. It should I guess my, my underlying thought related to this is at the end of the day, you are a governor representing a district in which you live and the lawyers that live within that district. And while I agree that we all practice law across the state, that you know this should be an organization for which we're looking at all of the lawyers globally, and that's why we have representatives to change our minds about things and make us see issues that impact other districts other than our own. But I think the bottom line is, is we are intended to be representatives of where we live and the issues that face the lawyers that we live in. And I think if we start diluting that message, this likely will impact more of the smaller counties than the larger ones. I mean, King County, I can guarantee you every Amazon lawyer and Microsoft lawyer is going to choose District 7 South. And while I'd love to have more attorneys, and I'm sure that they are like-minded in terms of the ideas that you know, are important to the lawyers in my area, that's not the goal, nor is it the intent to make sure that we are not representing all of the lawyers in their different issues of practice area. I mean, we heard yesterday from the tribal leaders that, you know, the issues that they face and how important all of all of that was for us to hear, to understand that. And if we start diluting residency as an important factor of what we hold as governors and districts, I think we're losing sight of the importance of why we have district governors and why we're all in this room. Great. Next, we have um, Kate Scher from the Office of General Counsel. And I'll just add to the answer to Governor Whitney's uh, question that under certain circumstances where somebody is practicing in multiple districts, um, that may just require them to make a judgment call about where they believe that they uh, more of their practice lies uh, than in the other districts. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Governor Couch and then Governor Ottawale. Uh what Governor Sayani said kind of made me realize and rethink a little bit that, you know, this discussion we're having goes away and becomes very simple if we just go with the option number five and add a seat for an out-of-state members. Uh, and maybe, if I mean, I don't know if other people have strong feelings on this. I do not. I kind of thought like four seems like an easier option at first. I'm being proven wrong by that, by this discussion. Um, <laughs> And so maybe that is something we should consider. And I'm curious if people have strong views either for or against option five, because it seems like option four is more complicated than I expected. President-elect Adewale. Unfortunately, Governor Sayani left the room before I could respond to his uh, concern about, about uh, my comment. I, I come from a semi-rural and semi-big city from District 5. I don't want to dilute the vote of my members, but I'm living with the reality that some of my members live across the state in Idaho. Some live in Montana, some live in Oregon, and yet they designated that their primary place of practice is in Spokane, and I have to respond to them. I don't want to take that options away from them to be able to vote in Spokane. And if this form, if this form or whatever they need to check is going to take that away from them, I'm opposed to that. I do realize that, you know, there's the reason we have congressional district in the first place is for us to be able to speak directly to issues that impact those districts. But we have always come here, as Governor Williams Rue reminded us, to look at the larger picture once we get elected. But I, I, Governor Couch, I is concerned about going with out of state. As your treasurer, I am concerned about the cost of flying somebody in 
from Tripoli, Libya, to come and attend a meeting of the World City Day by the Asian governor is in, at the state. Sorry. Sorry. No, sorry. I'm just asking for crosstalk to not happen. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm concerned about the cost of flying a digital, an at large seat meant for a global uh, representation to come from anywhere. I can be flying from Brazil. Um, I uh, can be flying from anywhere. And that's a huge cause. As treasurer, I'm concerned about that. And, you know, and there is no way that person will be able to say, I know what is going on with that large seat for someone in California or someone in Europe. Uh, it's really difficult to be able to manage that if going by Governor Sayani is a concern. Uh, so I, I, I think option five is really a difficult option if we look at all of that. Option five, four can be, uh, when this come back on second reading, option four can be made better from all the comments we have. We are discussing this because we want a better product. And I think that the regulator, chief regulatory council is going to take all of this comment into consideration and talk to the people that are going to be impacted by the decisions and hopefully we'll get something better. I'm not, I mean, we may just try this out and if it works good, or if it doesn't work, we can revisit it. Uh, but I don't want us to have a close mind with regards to some of the issues that were being raised today. Thank you. Chief Garcia and then Governor Williams Ruth. Um, after that, Governor Rathbone, then Governor Clark. No, Governor, it's not Governor, it's President. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Past President Clark. Clark. And also former governor. There we go. If you could take a look at page 213 of your materials, we have some input there from impacted members. So you're going to see that the preference would be to have a governor in the district, you know, be able to vote for a governor in the district of the primary practice, which is option four. Option four is currently in place right now. The change that we are proposing would be to make that ability to select your district of primary practice a little easier. That is all we are proposing for four. It's currently in place. Members already have that option. We would just be making it easier. And that, as you can see, is one of the alternatives that was preferred by the respondents. Another alternative that was voted, you know, had high votes for, it was uh, dedicating a seat, option five, right? And something we are not talking about here, but some of the respondents felt that simply voting for a large governors was sufficient representation. So we already have some input for you to consider. A not popular option was the idea of uh, being randomly selected assigned to a district. That is not something that, based on the survey, members would be, feel represented by that. Um, so I hope this, this helps. And if you do, you know, if you'd like us to do additional outreach, I'd appreciate um, what exactly that we haven't already asked that you're hoping we can. Thank you, out. Chief Garcia. Um, next, we have Governor Williams Ruth. On July 9th, we had our new governor orientation and yesterday on the bus ride back from Nospelum, I got the question, why did you go? And the answer is because it's a good reminder for us to know what our duties are as governors. And, you know, it seems to be, and I, and I wish Governor Sione was here because again, we do not, our duty, our legal duty as governors is not to a district. And yet we're saying it is. And also, it seems like once a meeting for the last five years, I keep referring to one of my favorite pages from a Google search that's really simple, WSBA, who we are. And it's the demographic information, currently, inf currently updated as of July 1, 2024. Because I also took issue with the fact that we think that all of our tech attorneys live in 7 South. You know, as someone who used to be a proud governor from the 8th Congressional District, I would say that Microsoft attorneys live in the 1st, the 8th, the 9th, 
the seventh north, the seventh south. You know, the second largest district is the zero district. There are 5,127 WSBA members of, of all type, of which active are only 38, wait, is that 38 or 30, 3887? But the only district larger than the zero district is seven south with 6,305, not 15,000, 6,305. The smallest is our host district. Thank you, Governor Rathbone, for bringing this in at um, 1,367. Now, I, <laughs> are we in the third? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was just, I'm looking. I mean, <laughs> the fourth. The fourth is, there we go. So I, I just, and, and maybe the answer is something that we've already passed, and I'm looking at Chief Nagowski now, Chief Nagowski, that it's going to be part of our new ambassadorial program. That, you know, this is, again, I, I, in my wisdom, I, I now feel like Governor Stevens a lot is, is the, the, the second oldest person on this board behind past President Clark I, in terms of tenure. I, I see that very few times do we have, remember I was sworn in a meeting before you, Governor Dresden. That's, that's, that, I see the scowl on the face. But more and more the issues are not just what we're talking about. There are bigger issues for the association. And again, and I want to be respectful of our treasurer and our incoming treasurer elect. There is monetary concerns, but I do not ever and will not ever support saying, well, it's too expensive, so let's write off those people. And we might have somebody from Tripoli. And then three years after that, we may have somebody from Denver or we may have somebody from Rio. And maybe that actually would be an amazing thing because though I wouldn't expect somebody from Tripoli to know what's happening with our members from New York, they would be able to give us a voice that's never been heard. And, and, you know, and maybe that is something that adds to the value of having an out of state person, you know, to have somebody that is from the great state of Oregon, President Shaketi that, you know, then we have people from all over the country and again, military service members. And yeah, there would be a cost. But again, even with international travel, no one being allowed to fly first class, they would have to fly coach. You know what? This is not 1982. It does not cost $5,000 to fly to Germany. And, you know, I think that what we're lacking is a greater understanding of how we're going to approach it. And maybe what we need to do is not take action today, but think about working with these rules with the new ambassadorial program, with what Chief Nagowski and her team are talking about in our new, because we, you might have forgotten, we are approaching this new year with so many new bold initiatives. Some we're going to see today with our governor roundtable. But again, the, the ambassador program, that was enacted that was voted on by this board but hasn't yet started and maybe that is where the answer is going to lie i mean i i am not advocating for one or the other but maybe the answer is that we pause this and look at what we're going to do in this next year with what's already been enacted well um adopted but not yet enacted so those are my thoughts thank you um Governor Rathbone, and then former president, past president Dan Clark, and former governor. Thank you. Uh, so my thoughts initially are, uh, Treasurer Odwalite, why can't we go to Brazil? Uh, so I just think that's very close thinking. No, but it, more seriously, uh, my so as fourth district, when I saw the number of seven thousand roughly, and correct me if I'm wrong, fit in this category. My district is not 7,000, although it's, you know, up. so when I started this conversation initially, I was gearing towards four, but everyone who has spoke primarily today has talked about the sea change in what this new post-COVID working attorney life is going to be and what it's going to look like. And where I sit right now, I don't think it's fair 
for our districts to just randomly assign people based on some arbitrary system. Since we are uh, since we are going to do a second read, I think my suggestion would be let's bring the numbers back and talk about what that looks like bringing on a at-large out-of-state member position so that we can look at what the real costs are in evaluating this. Because the more that we have this discussion, the more I'm gearing towards, I think if there are 7,000 members, I would say the survey numbers that we got back are pretty good response wise. So we know that these attorneys are engaged in what's going on here. And it's really important that we show them that we're carefully, you know, looking at this. So if we're going to do a second read, I think my suggestion other than to book us tickets to Rio, it would be to, um, would be to bring a uh, treasure odd Wally, if you don't mind. And, uh, I don't think Tiffany's on, is she? And Okay, just bringing us some rough numbers so we can look at what the costs of that are. Thank you, Governor Rathbone. And now um, President, past President Clark. Thank you so much. Um, so my, my own views are uh, option four makes sense. I'm uh, pretty strongly opposed to option five, but I, I, I I mean, there's no vote that that I have, so who cares? I, 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 in some ways, I guess. But um, in 2019, we did do a uh, um, a study though for board size, and we had found that we actually are are large now, and that was part of the bogs uh, um, back then when the uh, rejected the uh, um, three seats. So the cost to add one would would could be large, and I guess myself, if we're going to add one, I would rather see it be one of those other ones that the than you know than other one here. Um, and then finally, I'd say I don't think that you know option four is going to really add a lot for voting because we have such low voting rates now, mm -hmm. so it's not going to really skew things. So. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you, President Clark. Um, and I just want to make the point that this issue is for first read. So no action is required. Um, this could actually will be brought back at the September meeting. And um, Chief Garcia, do you want to add to that? Thank you. Thank you. So if you refer to your materials on page 211, you're going to see the fiscal impact analysis of this change. So there's an approximately $2,500 uh, expense related to um, administering and, and then a, the additional election, the seat, and then potentially $13,000 for uh, additional costs for travel. However, those are based on the current WISBA fiscal policies, which limit travel within uh, Washington state, right? So... It, it would the changes we make here would would impact uh, the fiscal policies would, which would have to be revised as well. Um, and I just want to know on option. Well, maybe I'll wait for clarity which option we want us to bring back, and then depending on way on it. Governor Fay, and then Governor Williams Ruth. Um, yeah, we have a district zero, but the people in district zero. Um, the, what they need from the WISBA uh, varies a great deal. Um, I would bet the majority of those folks are not military members in pick a country, but folks who uh, live in Oregon and work in Vancouver, uh, live in Idaho and work in Spokane, or even live in Canada. Um, and, and have some sort of physical presence close by. Um, military members are kind of busy they, when they're deployed. Um, and golly, a Perkins Coie lawyer who's doing a rotation in Washington, DC, they might not want to run for this District Zero either. My suspicion is that, 
but the, the I'm sorry, <clears throat> let me restate. They're in very different positions. So the person who, it's hard to represent the people in a district that is virtual. What are their interests? You know, they, 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 you know if we're gonna stick with ge geographically based representation, well, um, I think it would be better just to leave, leave them with the at large as opposed to making up something that is, is artificial. Governor Williams Ruth. Regarding the first read or not, does it count as a first read if we haven't actually accepted a proposal and saying this is the one we want to go with? I ask defer to. Because I mean, isn't the General whole thing Council. is the first read is saying here is an actual proposal. We want to give everyone notice that this is the one we're going to be acting on at the second read. And right now we have options, but unless we actually endorse one, then that wouldn't actually count as its first read. And I just want to clarify. Well, I'll see if general counsel wants to think about it. My own sense is you have two fully fleshed out proposals in your materials. So in fact, to me, it seems like just from a practical matter, you are able to have a first read on them and give feedback on them. But I don't know if you. Well, I don't know the answer to that. Just token. Chief, Chief uh, Disciplinary Counsel Endy, do you have any thoughts, opinions? Not really, but I agree with the, the sentiment that if you've read <laughs> multiple options, then you've read them. Right. And th they will b would both be valid and viable options on the, the second read and potential adoption. And I'll just add, I mean, I would say, so our intent would be to bring them back. But if the will of the board is to not bring them back at this time, then I would suggest someone make a motion to that effect, perhaps a motion to table, something like that. President-elect Adewale. In that case, can, can I use this? In that case, can we eliminate option one to three and then and just zero in on option four and five? Those are uh, the only ones provided as a first read, so. Yeah. Oh, four and five is the only one provided as first read. Correct. I think it, this is a first read, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if the board doesn't want us to bring them back, then tell us. Right. So if there is if there is no motion pending, what's going to happen is it's going to come back in September. If somebody from the board wants to make a motion about something specific that they want to see, then now is the time to make that motion. I'm waving my arm. <laughs> uh, Governor Fay, who is waving his arm. I move, I move that we move forward with option four uh, towards second read. So there's a motion on the table. Do I hear a second? I will second. Discussion? Governor Williams Ruth. Hold on. I would like to, I'm going to be voting no because I really would like to table this indefinitely until we've had a time to see what our new pathway forward is going to be like in terms of engagement in solving these issues um, and that they're great. I just don't know. I, I don't know whether I would want four or five until we know the things that we have already added, specifically the ambassadorial program that is already going to have an, a fiscal impact. And again, I think, you know, Chief Nagowski is here in the room hearing this discussion and knowing that this is going to be part of that program that she's going to be leading and the ambassadors that you, President Angela, will be, you know, putting in place, that I think that right now the, the wisest course of action would be to take no action and know that they're there, that we can come back with further insights saying that despite our, if our efforts, we weren't able to achieve the desired objectives. Director Nevitt. Um, as you all are considering your vote on this and also on a potential motion to table indefinitely, one thing I just wanted to reiterate it that uh, has already been said, but I just want to reiterate that option four 
is really the lay of the land already, except that we would be changing our process to make to ensure that more people take it up. So if you if there's something about um, option four other than procedural that, that substantively is a concern, then you might also want to consider <laughs> taking up our existing process. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you for that clarification. Um, President-elect Adewale. Um, my comment is when this come back for second read that um, I believe Chief Regulatory Council and Chief Nagelski would have an opportunity to be able to include uh, any informations about the um, ambassadorship and any other issues that were discussed today. Uh, if that is, if that understanding is wrong, can I be corrected by either of them? Okay, Chief Nagelski. Mary stole my microphone. Um, my understanding of the ambassador program is it's pretty, uh, the, what, what we have officially adopted is it's pretty public facing. And so I am interested to know, I, I'm not quite sure how that would align specifically with outreach to out of state members, other than of course, they will have the opportunity to participate in the ambassador program. We have definitely talked about uh, a listening tour, and I don't think we would fr fly to Libya, uh, sadly enough, but I do think we have certainly talked about, and I would love to include an annual quote unquote listening tour stop that is for all out of uh, state members, right? And we could even be more targeted that we could do out of state military, we could do out of state, uh, out of country, you know, I, so I think there is a lot of opportunities, you know, if you wanted to directly get feedback about what their issues are, what a panel looks like, we could do a panel here, right? So I think to Brent's point, we could specifically do a lot of things for you to be able to hear what concerns are the lay of the land for members who are not in Washington state and what, you know, to hear directly from them about some of these options. And so I would be happy to put together some engagement opportunities if you would like to do that before um, moving forward. Hanata did get, I mean, it was like 300 responses. It wasn't too bad. But if you would actually like to not, not just hear what, how would you like to vote, but if you would like an opportunity to hear from what are concerns you have, what does it look like? How do you like to interface with the WSBA? We could certainly do that before you, I mean, de facto, there's already an option that's in place for these folks to vote. And if you would like to hear more before you decide on an option like number five, we can do that. Thank you, Chief Nagelski. Um, and I'm gonna ask uh, General Counsel Lori Powers to speak. And after that, uh, I think we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Just two observations. One, I think it's interesting with option five that it's not like we have a coalition of out of state members who are asking us to act on their behalf, right? This is with 300 people respond. Some of them are interested in that. So it's just, it's a little bit different posture than having an organized group that is asking for this. So I think that's interesting. I am curious if um, Chief Regulatory Counsel um, Garcia could ask in terms of the timing or if this is tabled indefinitely in terms of what you would need to do when um, for the licensing, what's the timing in terms of when it's, there's a change that needs to be made or if they on the second read on the, for option four, what's just kind of your timing in terms of a decision being made for anything to be enacted before the next licensing cycle? So licensing opens usually November 1st. Um, so if this is coming for second reading September, then we probably have enough time to implement for this season. Otherwise, probably not until next year. Thank you. And before we take a break, um, I really do want to acknowledge one person in the room who also really saved the day yesterday, and that is Riverside Dave. So can we can we applaud him? When we get back, so we're gonna we're gonna break for ten now, folks. Nope. When we come back.
I know. Lots, lots and lots of issues. I am too It's very jarring. Um, yes. Uh, Governor Fay. Um, we can't do nothing because we have a problem right now. We have, uh, if we have just voted to eliminate the requirement for a res resident agent. So there is now a hole in our voting procedure. It needs to be filled. Um, my observation is that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, the good is let's is providing path for the people who used to have a registered agent who, by the way, uh, in this state, the professional resident agents are all in the 10th district for Olympia um, to give an, a, to give an avenue for those folks to vote, at least for the at large. So I would, well, I am touting the own, my own motion uh, to go for the simple, clean, elegant, easy solution. And if we want to think about uh, a vast restructuring of how we parcel votes, uh, we can do that later. Because, you know, do we want to do it by practice area? Do we want to do it by geography at all? I, they're huge questions. Let's fill this hole now. And we can think real hard in the future if we want to redo the whole thing. Thank you, Governor Fay. And I also just want to make a plug for the Governor's Roundtable, which is happening um, later on, that is going to be an opportunity for us to discuss uh, broader general issues. So things that arise out of our discussions, that's definitely, there's another opportunity for us to really have robust discussions. Um, it's now time for vote, unless I hear or see any other hands raised. Um, I'm going to ask Director Nevitt to take the vote. All right. This is on the motion that we move forward with option four for a second read. Christina Larry. Aye. Brent Williams Ruth. No. Allison Whitney. Aye. Mary Rathbone. No. Serena Sayani. Okay. Not present. Kari Petrasek. Aye. Jordan Couch. Aye. Matthew Dresden. Aye. Nam Nguyen. Not present. Francis Adewale. Aye. Kevin Fay. Aye. Motion passes seven to two. Great. And now I will. Um, No, just is that Allison and you and Mary. Oh. Okay. Okay. Chief Garcia, I would ask you to um, proceed if you have more to present. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, right now we are going to transition to uh, admissions. Um, the proposed amendments here to APR 3 um, are intended to remove some barriers for admission uh, for lawyer spouse of active U.S. military service members. And you can refer to your materials starting on page 226. That's not a good picture. Uh, military spouse admission by motion, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that option, but it's very similar to the regular admission by motion option we have in this state. Um, so the main difference, and, and just to clarify, the regular admission by motion I'm referring to uh, is for those with three years of ex practice experience and they are licensed in another state 
they can uh, be admitted in Washington state. The main difference between military spouse admission by motion and regular admission by motion is how the application is um, reviewed. Um, so essentially the military spouse admission by motion applications are reviewed in-house, so by staff, with by staff, uh, which results in a faster and less expensive process for them. And that's because everyone else who is the regular admission by motion uh, applicant has to go through NCBE and the investigation done by then takes about four to six months and the NCB collects an additional fee, which is around $550. So this option is a faster and cheaper option for, um, for people, right? So the reason this rule exists is because spouses of active service members often need to relocate when their spouse is transferred to a new military station, right? Because of this reallocation, this relocation, the lawyer spouse has to um, often has to change, you know, where they admitted, seek admission in multiple jurisdictions, and there is also the cost associated with applying for admission and the potential loss of income, right, while you're waiting for admission. So, in order to reduce all those barriers, the Washington Supreme Court adopted the military spouse admission by motion rule in 2019. You're probably wondering why, why are we here then? Everything sounds great. The issue we are noticing is because the applicant for admission by motion, the military spouse admission by motion, as the rule is written currently, cannot qualify for general admission by motion, nor UBE score transfer. Um, only people who have, a, who have less than three years of experience qualify which means anyone with three years or more of experience practicing in another state will be disqualified for military spouse admission by motion, right? So this really limits the pool of applicants that are able to take advantage of this expedited and, and cheaper option. Also, because the court approved in concept the Washington Bar Licensure Task Force recommendation to reduce the admission by motion and experience requirement from three years to one year, that will further reduce the pool of applicants who can qualify for military spouse admission by motion, right? Since anyone with more than one year of experience would have to apply through the regular admission by motion process. So this is a very simple uh, proposal here. We are proposing that we remove the criteria the military spouse applicant not qualify for admission by motion or UBE score transfer. So essentially, we believe this is going to remove, you know, some some barriers. It would expand the pool of applicants who might be eligible. Um, and it, we also think, you know, if the court adopts the reduction from three to one year for admission by motion, um, that will you make more sense to have those two requirements align and not further limit the pool of applicants. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Governor Couch. I served on the Young Lawyers with some, a couple of women who were military spouses and talked about the issues that they had long ago. Uh, this to me seems like a really simple and good thing to do. And so I would move to approve this recommendation. Second, I would second. Oh. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask Director Nevin. Nancy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nancy Hawkins, our public member. I apologize. No problem. Um, mine is a separate issue, and I speak as a member, not as a representative from FLEC. The, uh, on, at page 231, the definition of military spouse refers to the definition, quote, as defined by the United States Department of Defense, end quote. And I would suggest an amendment to say as presently defined by the U.S. Department of Defense. It is quite possible that by a few months from now, we will have different leadership at the Department of Defense. It is quite possible that those 
uh, individuals involved in gay or lesbian marriages will no longer consider be considered spouses uh, within the military system. And so in order to protect um, those um, people that are currently considered spouses, I think we should address that issue at this time. Now, it may be that a different amendment would be more appropriate to do so. It may be that there's an additional amendment to protect people defined as domestic partners, perhaps that could be down the road. But at a minimum, if we said as presently defined, that would mean that if that definition was later changed by the Department of Defense, it would still be based on, our rule would still be based on current definition. Thank you, Nancy. Does anyone have any comments or thoughts on what Ms. Hawkins just said? Um, would that be a friendly amendment that uh, Governor Couch would take? Governor Couch? Yes, I would accept that friendly amendment. Uh, I think I think the uh, definition is not uh, of spouse. It is of the what constitutes United States Uniform Services. Um, at least that's how I read it. Um, I'm not sure that we can't fix this right now by a little bit of drafting. Um, but as presently. Well, there's no time set for the uh, the rule to speak, so um, I don't think that fixes it. But a little bit of, of drafting, I think, would be able to fix this, just by replacing that definition with what the definition is of the the, the uniform services, um, and that would require a Google search and and just a little wordsmithing. So. I would ask for a friendly amendment so that uh, we can get a, a quick and dirty redraft and pass it at a different meeting once the redrafting is done. Just to make clear that the, de that the definition isn't of marriage, it is of the uniform services. Governor Williams Ruth. As someone who was in a relationship before it was recognized federally, I will say that I actually appreciated the way Chase Bank handled things because they had branches all over the country in states with a variety of different laws. All you had to do to be able to get benefits was establish three things that had nothing to do with the law. And I would object to going to any definition that's defining a spousal relationship by law, because even in Washington, we're not secure. If we're talking about honoring and representing people who are in committed intimate relationships, we need to acknowledge that Washington recognizes those CIRs now being involved to being called equity relationships. And we should have a rule that reflects that and not by the whim of a statute or a military code or anything else. That if we're talking about allowing this to be people who are military service members who can designate. And again, the, the rule that the, the bar was very low for chase because again, they had branches in Mississippi and Mississippi was not anywhere near the forefront of recognizing the rights and privileges of same sex spouses or domestic partners or whatever the terms were being batted around from 2010 to 2012. So, I agree that we should revise the definitions and make it reflective of the values of the Washington State Bar Association and our large umbrella vision of DEI and inclusion and that um, we, we spend some time to actually create a definition that does recognize and honor anyone that would fall under what we would recognize as a couple. And uh, thank you, Governor Williams Ruth. And I have a clarifying question of Chief Gana um, Garcia. Uh, was an equity analysis done with respect to this proposed amendment? And did that analysis include a consideration of the issues raised by Ms. Hawkins? Yeah. 
to Julie. Yeah, thank you. And Chief Garcia, do you have any thoughts yourself as to the issues that have been raised? I'm just curious. Um, I, I think we can come back with some additional language and, and revised wording to address the concerns raised here today. But, but I think the definition, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I think the definition is referring to service members, not the spouse. What, what's being defined here is what the uniform services are, not what a spouse is. So if we clarify that definition, that you know, a spouse is a spouse, um, and under Washington law, you know, you, you can have all, anybody, well, you can be a, a gay person married to another person. Um, under Washington law, I don't, you know, a spouse is a spouse. So let's just fix, make it clear what is being defined and, and, be, and, and, and move forward. Governor Couch and then um, General Counsel Lori Powers. Uh, if I remember correctly, the friendly amendment wasn't seconded, which is, I think, great, because at this point in time, I'm realizing I think this is an interesting conversation that is uh, has nothing to do with what we're addressing with this bylaw that we've come prepared to talk about today. And so my hope would be we just move forward with the original motion. Uh, and I believe we have a bylaws review committee that this would be a great thing to flag to them and say, hey, can we look at this uh, use of spouse and maybe we need to look into other places in the bylaws where spouse is mis mentioned instead of you know partner or something like that um, I think that might be a great opportunity to do that uh, and a great place for that to be done but I think we have a motion on the table that's substantive for what we're dealing with right now General Counsel Powers I'm just going to comment that it, I, I agree with what Governor Faye was saying about and, and uh, Council uh, Garcia about it, it defining it regarding military spouse it, it, or military service Perhaps it's just as simple as saying spouse is defined by Washington law and, and making clear about that in there because it, I think this issue has existed. I think what Governor Couch is saying prior to this amendment, this issue of uh, how spouse is defined. Um, spouse isn't being defined. No, no I know. But, military services is being defined. No, I understand that. But we are using the term spouse and maybe what we're needing about what's who we're covering. So perhaps what need, is needed whenever there is spouse is being clear that we're talking about the definition of spouse under Washington law, um, because that is defined by state. So um, it's just something to think of, but I, I think what Jordan, uh, Governor Couch is saying is this is a different, larger issue beyond what's just here right now. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna direct uh, Director Nevitt to take a vote. So this is on the motion to approve the proposal as presented. This is the original motion with no amendment. Chris, what is the motion? What is the motion? to what approve is the proposal as it was presented. Oh, okay. Chris, military? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. The, the motion was just to approve the proposal. Um, so it's to, hold on. As this, Yes. Okay. No, there was an amendment, there was a friendly amendment that was not seconded. And so Governor Couch indicated he was reverting to his original motion. Yeah. Okay, Christina Larry. Aye. Brent Williams Ruth. No. Allison Whitney. Aye. Mary Rathbone. Aye. Serena Sayani, not present. Kari Petrosic. Jordan Couch? Aye. Matthew Dresden? Aye. Nam Nguyen? Not no. present. Francis Adewale? Aye. Kevin Fay? Aye. Motion passes with one nay vote. Just a quick reminder to use the microphones when you're doing your votes. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. Chief Garcia? Thank you. Okay, so we talked about voting, we talked about admissions, now we are going to move to licensing. Um, and we would like to request that the BOG eliminate the requirement that we deliver the pre-suspension notice to members by, um, 
by certified mail and to consider instead allowing us to provide that notice either through email only or through uh, first class mail. The materials start on page 232. So every year when members fail to renew their licenses, they are subject to administrative suspension under APR 17. Um, APR 17 directs the Bar Association to determine the pre-suspension requirements that will be adopted. So the court delegated this to the Bar Association. The current bylaws require WISBA staff to send members a paper pre-suspension notice by certified mail with a return receipt. In addition to that, we are also required and we do call every single person on that pre-suspension uh, list. This year, we mailed um, a little over 1,500 uh, notices. Uh, the postage for each certified mail is $8.69. Uh, so the total postage for this uh, project was around $13,500. Of the 1,523 members who received a pre-suspension uh, notice, 220 uh, were, had their licenses suspended. And as you can see uh, on the screen, this, this is essentially the same as prior years, right? And this is so despite the fact that we have adopted uh, a paperless license renewal. Um, so even though members are now receiving notification of their requirement to renew their license by email only, we are not seeing an increase in the number of suspensions or the number of notices sent out. So in my mind, that demonstrates that members are indeed receiving the information they need to about license renewal through emails and with the website and other means of communication. So what we are seeing here, we are presenting to you uh, some opportunities, right? We, we see this as an opportunity to eliminate um, the use of certified mail, I think, we would advance our goal of becoming a paperless right, organization. Certified mail is labor intensive. Uh, we have to physically affix the green certified mail label and return receipt cards to each envelope. Um, and we estimate that eliminating this requirement will free up about 50 hours of staff time, not to mention the actual postage cost, which I mentioned, 13500 So we are here today for first read, and the idea is to ask your thoughts and to have you consider um, whether this notice could be done um, in another way, right? So we are proposing two options for your consideration. One would be the notice by email and the other by first class mail. If we adopt the first class mail option, that would translate in savings of 12000 $12,200 approximately. Um, and I just want to make it very clear that regardless of the, the change here, either email or first class regular mail, we still intend and we are not asking you to remove the requirement that we call every single person. So regardless of the option chosen today or the next meeting, we would continue to make those phone calls and reach, reach out to members. I, in case it's helpful for comparison, uh, Oregon uh, delivers the pre-suspension notice by email only. Um, so again, this is first read, it's for discussion. Uh, if you have any questions for me or have any thoughts on what we could do differently to come back uh, in September, that would be great. Thank you. Governor Fay. Um, I love email. I love it so much, I get so much of it. <laughs> And so much important email that comes to me ends up in my spam folder. Um, I have no problem with saving money, but I think at least for a certain slash of lawyers of a certain age, uh, paper is much more likely to get their attention than an email. And since it's about suspending their license, I would suggest we uh, take a third path and say by first class mail and email. And that may obviate the need to make a phone call.
Any other comments, questions? Governor Williams Ruth. Chief Garcia, did, did you say 50 hours of time for filling out the 1500? It's, it's a big pro, yes. Stop time. Okay, because in the world of probates, whenever you contest a creditor claim, you have to give notice via certified mail. So my office does that all the time. And um, I just, I had my office director fill one out and um, that just seemed, I mean, even 1,550 hours seems a lot. I mean, I'm all for efficiency in time. I just, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to make sure that your staff is being the most efficient when filling out a certified mail receipt. It's, it's not difficult and especially once we started doing them all the time that it was part of our process, we actually just have a stack of them in our office and my office director knows how to fill them out. So I, I, I'm, I, I question the 50 hours worth of time. I mean, I, it's, it's a lot and it's a pain, but that, that's, I, I'm, I'm specious on that. It is a manual process and large number of people and we have to make sure we are very accurate um, and I, I welcome Bobby Henry if you want to weigh in on that I haven't personally been involved lately on the mailing um, and I know that there were some changes so maybe Bobby can tell us more about it um, <clears throat> Chief Garcia are you asking hang on a second uh, President-elect Adewale, are you asking for Mr. Henry to weigh in? If he has anything additional to yes. share. Thank you. He, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing that I would add is that um, it's, it's, I know that in some offices, there's an electronic version of certified mailing that's possible. Um, we aren't able to do that um, and we have to print the cards with the labels, um, we need to affix a sticker to the envelope. We need to prepare the return receipt. We have to stick that on the back of the envelope and then we have to seal all those envelopes and then they have to be, you know, and before all that, they're they're sorted. The letters are sorted, the envelopes are sorted, the labels are sorted, everything is pre-sorted. And so it is a huge project and we wanna make sure that the right letter is going to the right person because there are um, some personalized information in each letter. So um, that's that was the estimate that we came up with at, at the time that it takes to do that project. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Um, I believe uh, President-elect Adewale and then Governor-elect Villeneuve. I am in agreement with Governor Williams Root on this. There is an efficiency issue if we are going by these hours. I some of these can really be automated and once you get once you do it it's something you do every year it appears before you could take the means of livelihood of someone you better be sure that that person is given enough notice about it um so like governor faye said we have a lot of members uh, baby boomers who are not vast in technology, who may not have the same access as so many of our young attorneys do have. So I'm I'm really concerned about this. And plus the cost, if if it costs thirteen thousand five hundred and sixty three to make people uh, keep their means of livelihood, I. I'm sorry, it's it's not a waste of money. I uh, I want to save money. I, I you all know that I want to save money, but I, I I'm concerned that there might be some. Uh, th there is a concern about not delivering this the right way, and that leads to another lawsuit on the other hand. So I'm concerned about that. Governor Elect Villeneuve. Um. In federal court, when you provide your email, you opt in to a preferred mode of communication, which, oh, oh. 
So you opt in into a preferred mode of communication. So my question is just, is as part of our process, when we request emails for people, is, is the process to say, do you elect for email communication or not? Chief Garcia, do you want to answer that quickly? Um, no. Um, so if you take a look at APR 13, well, not everyone has a rule book. So APR 13, uh, members are required to provide um, an electronic mail address. So every member should have an email address with the Bar Association. And I understand they made some points about the, the dollar amount that could be saved and staff time. I, I think this is also more than that, right? Like email communication is the most used method of communication. We talk about technology in practicing law and being able to maintain your email, check your emails, understand what goes to junk mail. I think that's uh, so, th that's uh, something that members, yeah. So, so my question is, is at the time that every member is asked to submit an email, there could be a little box to just say, click here and you agree to email communications moving forward. So once you've agreed to that, then to me, the communication by email to these people would, would save time and would be approved. That's how it works in federal court. Okay. Um, and next, Governor Rathbone. I'm going to withdraw my request. Okay. Okay. Uh, Governor Williams Ruth. As someone who had a litigation practice that was 100% in federal court, I agree that their ECF system is amazing and spectacular. But also, when a message came in from ECF, it was, you know, with a very special subject line, there was no missing it. My concern is. You know, the WSBA uses and utilizes email communication for a multitude of reasons. And again, when we're talking about a person's license, which they actually have a constitutional right to once they've earned it, I, I just don't support the idea that we, you know, and, and again, for those who have not been on this board for years, you have not heard me continuously rail against our postal system and, and how it currently is acting. I mean, I just had another returned letter that I had mailed in February come back to my office as undelivered last week. I have clients that live, I mean, I, I could literally walk to places in parts of the county and deliver mail than what is being sent via regular first class mail. And there's no rhyme or reason. And, you know, it's, it's again, part of the probate process is the notice period where you have to send it out. So I work with the mail a lot. In fact, I just discovered that my last attempt to buy a thousand stamps before the price went up didn't actually go through. So now I'm losing five cents extra per stamp. But we're talking about someone's license. And, you know, even if it does take 50 hours, even if there is the cost, I'm happy to add other methods to ensure delivery. But the number of emails I do not read from the WSBA for, and, and, you know, I, I, and I just, I like having that record. I like protecting us. I like knowing that we have a certified receipt that has come back saying this was delivered. So if anyone wants to come back and say, I didn't know, how are we going to have that with email? Well, well, we sent this. My last name is Williams Ruth hyphenated. Do you know how many emails get sent to William Ruth with a hyphen, without the hyphen? And then they call my office saying, why didn't you respond to me? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. And then I have to be the one that genuflects because they misspelled my name. You know, our, our system, our database is not flawless. I like the belts and suspenders when we're talking about somebody's license. I will continue to fund doing a, a way to ensure that we have done everything to convey a notice. Okay. So I will not be supporting this motion either. Okay. Governor Petrosic. So in my 
practice over a number of years, I've had to send out certified letters, both for collection cases as well as family law and other type of civil cases. I can say that I've gotten back um, certified letters because they weren't claimed either because a person refused to sign for them or maybe they were out and after so many attempts, post office will return them if they aren't able to serve it. A non-certified letter will always get delivered to a person regardless if they're on vacation for a month or not, regardless of how many attempts, because it's just going to go in their mailbox. Um, what I saw based on um, the data that uh, Chief Garcia showed is that these people receive notice through mail, whether or not they, well, they presumptively s signed for it because it was certified. And there are approximately 200 people that still were suspended. I would guess that even if those letters had not been certified, the same amount of people would have received those letters, responded to it because they call and email them after that to follow up. Um, and so I somewhat think that if the letters were just sent by regular first class mail, not only would the bar save money, but there are follow up methods, phone and email to ensure that they got the letter. Um, I just think it's more efficient to just send the letter by regular mail and not have to require them to sign for a letter that those 200 people may have been suspended if they didn't get the letter because they didn't want to sign for it. <laughs> Chief Garcia. No. Okay. Director Nevitt. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, not seeing any other hands at this time, is there, is there a motion? Not as yet. Sorry, this is first read, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's my fault. So, it's first read. So it'll, come back. it'll come back in September. Yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you, Chief. Any thoughts on which option should come back both <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to bring back both and have that discussion again Can I see, please? go ahead president-elect adewale and then uh governor couch uh if you uh, chief garcia, if, if chief garcia wanted to read the room and you wanted us to communicate to you what we are thinking i think that's the right thing to do and i think we probably should um, indicate how we want this to proceed to give clarity to the staff. Um, personally, for me, I think this is a no. Perhaps we could do a straw poll, Chief Garcia. That would be helpful. Thank okay. you. And Governor Couch, did you want to stay say something? No. He covered it. Okay. Uh, General Counsel Powers. Just one, so I, just to be clear, maybe this is already clear to everyone. So the issue has, has um, uh, Governor Williams was talking about absolutely around due process right to know that. And the question is, what is adequate notice, right, for doing something like that? And so, you know, we have regular mail, we have email, we have phone, uh, all those plus, and then we also right now have certified mail. So it's, it's not that people aren't getting notice, but what do we think is adequate in this situation? Um, and I know that um, Regulatory Council had talked about what other states do and things. And I think that is an interesting thing about how they did. Just as an aside, I was looking at um, uh, our our friends from Colville on the tribe, and I think we're showing somebody on their website last night. It just says, it's on their website. If you don't do this by this date, you're out, basically. I mean, that's like, that's their notice, right? And obviously it's just a system, but there's lots of ways to approach this and different states have done this. So there's not just one right way. And it's a decision of what I think this body thinks is adequate notice for this issue. Thank you, Council Power. Straw vote. Straw poll. We just do a show hands? Yeah, yeah, we can do a show. That can be straw-like. <laughs> Hanada, why don't you present the options that you'd like to see hands on and then first say them all and then we'll say each and let people put their hands up. Maybe no, no change to the current process. How to... Why don't you say all the options? And then all that. So one would be no change, e send by email only or first class mail. Okay. Or first 
first class bill and the email. We we email and call everyone no okay. matter what. Right. Yeah. So the choice is between first class mail or regular mail. First class mail is regular mail. Okay, I'm going to restate them. I'm going to restate them. So uh, keep in mind, we email everybody no matter what. That's the baseline. So the first option is we make no change. We continue to email, call, and send certified mail. The second option is we switch to first class mail. Still email, still call, but now we do first class mail instead of <laughs> certified. And then the third option is we just do email and we don't mail anything. Okay, so for the first option, which is no change, continue to use certified mail, hands up. Two. Okay. Oh, no, no, not two. Oh, three. Okay. And then the second option is to switch from certified mail to first class mail. Six. And then the final option is no physical mail, just email and phone calls. Okay, very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Chief Garcia. All right, I'm walking you through all the regulatory processes, right? It's so right, right, right now, unless you need a break, we are going to move to MCLE. Uh, and for that, I'm gonna transition and give the mic to Bobby Henry. Great, thanks, uh, Hanada. Um, good morning, everyone. So now we are going to be actually talking about license status changes um, and then what the MCLE requirements are for someone who's returning to active status from another status. Um, this is a first read uh, for the bylaws amendments. So this is just for discussion and feedback. Um, yeah, so let me start with just some background first um, and kind of a description of the current state so and the history. So about 20 years ago, um, when a member was inactive or suspended for three years or more, the only way for them to return to active status was to take and pass the bar exam. Um, and then we got a lot of feedback about that, you know, that it was onerous. And, you know, as people started taking more time off from the practice of law, either for raising children or for uh, medical conditions and stuff like that. Three years just was uh, not long enough for some of those situations. And having to take the bar exam just seemed like too high of a burden. So it changed to five out of the last 10 years. So if a member was inactive or suspended for more than five years, then they had to take the bar exam. And still that seemed like not enough time and so it was changed again um, to 10 years which is the current situation if a member is inactive or suspended for more than 10 years without any active legal experience then they have to take and pass the bar exam to return and so as that period of time grew um, in order to demonstrate the continued competence of that member um, we put in mcle requirements and so in order to return this, there were certain numbers of MCLE requirements that the member needed to do in order to return to active status. And so the purpose of that is to protect the public by making sure that those members who've been away from the practice have continued competence to practice law. And so as it evolved over time, we ended up with this really complicated, um, with at least eight different scenarios of depending on what, what status the member was in and how long the member was um, not active. And so this slide, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but just kind of shows that there's all these different uh, requirements and it depends on how long the member's been inactive or suspended or and how long they were not active. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so another issue that we also are um, addressing goes back again to the admission by motion change. Um, so as we reduce uh, the numbers, number of years of active legal experience required um, for new members to be admitted to the bar, um, we wanna make sure that it's not harder for um, uh, a member, current member who's on inactive status say to come back to active status than it is for someone to be admitted newly to the bar in the first instance. 
Um, so the proposal is to um, make changes so that it's it's um, actually one yeah this slide. Um, so the we want to clarify and we want to simplify and we want to streamline the requirements so it's easy for the staff to understand. It's easy for the members to understand, um, and we want to make sure that it's similar and equitable approaches for members, regardless of how long they've been gone, um, what status they're coming from, and making sure, again, it's not harder for a, um, a member to return to active than to be admitted. And so we're hoping that this proposal will uh, make for a more efficient process. It'll make it uh, less time for the member to um, return to active and just an overall better experience. Next slide, please. So um, this is a summary of the proposal um, and the, the outcomes that we're hoping to get out of this. So first off, we wanted to find additional ways to establish competence. So um, right now it's MCLE requirements or the bar exam. Um, so, um, what we looked at was admission by motion. You know, people can be admitted based on active legal experience in another jurisdiction. So we're applying that. We want to apply that to members returning to active status. So if someone is inactive in Washington and they're practicing somewhere else, say California, they are able to use that active legal experience to return back to active without having to do MCL requirements. Um, also in the proposal, um, would be accepting comedy certificates from our MCLE comedy states, which are uh, Oregon, Idaho, and Utah. So if a member uh, can provide a certificate saying that they're current in that state, then they don't need to do the MCLE requirements in Washington to return to active. And uh, again, we're trying to get more uniform MCLE requirements. Um, right now, um, it varies depending on how long the person was gone or, you know, not active. And so we want to make it standard that's equivalent to one MCLE reporting period, which is the 45 credits for a lawyer member um, with 15 law and legal and six ethics and whatever else might be coming down in the future. Um, and then always making it a standard look back period. So 45 credits within the last six years. Um, instead of sometimes it's three years, sometimes it's six. Um, so just make it standard. And then also a fixed date for the look back period. Um, so we wanna base it on the date that they filed their application to return to active. So that way they look back from that specific date and know that they have the 45 credits that they need. Um, right now it floats depending on when they actually return. So sometimes credits can drop off and then they have to do more credits because it took a while for the process to happen. Um, and then finally, just reducing other barriers and ensuring some consistency. Um, we, uh, for members who are inactive or suspended for more than six years, they are required to uh, attend a reinstatement course and it has to be a live reinstatement course and it's only offered twice a year um, and so, that causes a lot of people to have to wait up to six months um, to be reinstated. Um, and then they also need to you know, watch it live. So what we're saying in our proposal is to make it um, live or recorded so they can watch the recorded version. That's gonna significantly reduce the amount of time um, to be reinstated for a lot of members. Um, in addition to that, the reinstatement course credits are in addition to the 45 that are required. The proposal is to allow the, the 15 credits to count towards the 45. So that reduces the burden by 15 credits um, for members returning to active. Um, and because we're using active legal experience, um, judicial positions are included in the active legal experience definition. And so there won't be any MCLE requirements for judicial members returning to active status. And then finally, just uh, outstanding MCLE late fees um, requiring all members, uh, regardless of what their current status is, to pay the um, any 
any MCLE late fees that might be owed before they return to active. Um, so that's that's a kind of a summary of all of the different uh, proposed uh, changes we're suggesting. Um, if you go back one slide, Hanada, there's um, the outstanding MCLE late fees. There's three groups where we don't collect MCLE late fees currently. Um, and we didn't think that was the right thing to do. So we are collecting MCLE late fees owed from all members when they return to active status, regardless of what their status was before. Uh, next slide. And then one more. Okay, so um, there's some things that aren't changing um, for the requirements to return to active. Um, and there's they primarily relate to less than one year um, of out of uh, status. So it, in the case where someone is inactive or suspended for less than one year and they're not due to report or it's their first reporting period, then they don't have any requirements and we're not changing that. If it was less than one year, but they were due to report, they have to complete that um, reporting period that they were inactive for. And this is sort of a, a protective um, anti, you know, beat the system provision so that someone can't go inactive because they're due to report and then stay inactive for a few months and come back and say, oh, I missed the reporting period, so I don't have to do my credits. Um, and so we're not changing that. And then we're not changing that members who are suspended for not doing their MCLE, that they have to comply with the period that they were suspended for. And we're not changing the 10 years um, with no active legal experience uh, means you have to take the bar exam. So there's no change to that either. And the next slide. So a big change is adding the active legal experience. It's going to help a lot of people because a lot of members do go inactive and go practice somewhere else, and then they come back later. Um, and so what it does, if you have the active legal experience, it removes the MCLE credit requirement almost completely for all the members in all the situations. So if you look at the, the far right column under proposed, no MCLE requirement all the way down, with the only exception being if you if it's over six years, um, then the member needs to watch the uh, reinstatement course. They can watch it or attend five, it's up to them. And then for members who don't have active legal experience, they were just inactive and you know doing whatever it was that they wanted to do for five or six years, um, then we're just making the credit requirements the same. So if you go down the far right column again, you see 45 credits <clears throat> within the last six years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then again, reinstatement course, if it's over six years, but it's going to be, <clears throat> sorry, it's going to be uh, recorded or live and the credits uh, count towards the 45 credits. So uh, in a nutshell, that is our proposal. Um, it looks very complicated when you look at all the words in the bylaws amendments, <clears throat> but the outcome is actually pretty simple, um, especially compared to what it is now. So we welcome your feedback and questions. Thank you, Associate Director Henry. Does anyone have any questions for Director Henry? Anyone want to make him? Oh, okay. So this will be brought back in September. Okay, well, seeing no other comments, um, Chief Garcia. All right, last but not least, uh, Doug and I would like to propose that you adopt a bylaw amendment that would create an inactive license fee exemption due to significant health condition. I'll explain uh, what we mean by that. Ooh, I went too far in this one. Okay, so right now, members experiencing a significant health uh, condition have a few options as it relates to their license in Washington, right? Someone experiencing a hardship like that could go inactive, 
So that means they are not eligible to practice law and they would be paying a $200 license fee. So it's a discounted fee. But as Bobby just walked you through, they would be retaining the ability to return to active status following all of the MCLE requirements, right? Someone who is eligible, meaning they have at least 50 years of active or judicial experience could choose to go to an honorary status. So that's a type of inactive status and that would allow them to um, not have a license fee essentially. So it's an inactive status that does not have any fees associated with it. Voluntarily resigning is always an option for members. Um, and then <laughs> another one, and that's what we are gonna cover here today is the disability inactive status. Uh, that status also does not have any license fee uh, attached to it. Uh, but that system, how you obtain that status, it's not a regulatory, um, it's not through the regulatory services department, it is through the disciplinary system. And that's why Doug is here today. He's going to walk you through some of the challenges we have with disability inactive status. Okay. Um, and the reason we are bringing this here today, every year, a couple of members, sometimes more, sometimes less, will reach out. And they will reach out around the deadline for license renewal, which is February 1st. And they're experiencing something significant, right? And they are telling us, I see that option, disability inactive. I'm facing that issue. I, I would like to take advantage of that. And I wish I could just say, yes, let's change your status. Don't have to worry about this. Go take care of your health, right? Take a break. It's not that simple. Disability inactive status require, often requires a stipulation or a hearing, and Doug will walk you through that. And it's very awkward to tell someone who is voluntarily coming to you, asking for help, to say, you know what? You have to go through the disciplinary system when they haven't, you know, there's no grievance pending, there's no disciplinary process. So it's not ideal, as you can imagine. And oftentimes you have to tell them, I'm sorry, you know, this process takes a long time. You need to renew your license or choose some of the other options I, I walk you through. Um, otherwise you could face suspension. Uh, so what we have here today for you, it's not perfect, but it's much better than what we have right now. Um, and I'll just uh, transfer to Doug right now. Thanks, Hanada. <clears throat> Hanada's done an excellent job setting the stage for what the problem is that we are trying to solve. And for a moment, and just to underscore what Hanada has set up, put yourself in the position of such a member. And, and bear in mind that there's only a handful of these that come forward every year. And you're having a health condition. It is licensing season. You have gotten the licensing forms and it, it's time to fill them out and pay the licensing fee. And it occurs to you, I'm, I need, I'm going to step away from the practice of law for a while to, to deal with my situation. And I wonder what my options are uh, because I'm not going to be practicing. I don't want to practice law. Uh, and, I, and it may be a bit of a struggle since I have no income from the practice of law to, to pay the full freight licensing fees. So what are my options? And these are the options that are presented. You can resign and, and many folks, that's not quite what I'm, what I'm after. Uh, are, are, are you eligible for honorary status? Well, no, I haven't been practicing for 50 years. That's a tiny population. Um, well, inactive may, may be right for you. Sounds good. There's a $200 inactive license fee. Sounds not so good. Well, there, there is one other path. That's the disability inactive status. There's no licensing fee, but there is a catch. You are going to be sent into the embrace of the discipline system. <laughs> so we can, we can go to the next slide. Now, that presents 
th th that's a hard path. <laughs> that's a hard road uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, they're complicated procedures under the rules for enforcement of lawyer conduct from how you get to point A, <laughs> active license status, to point B, disability and active status. It was, the ELC was never designed to address this situation. It is designed for report, third party reports that a, a, a lawyer is struggling and may lack capacity to practice law, which triggers an investigation or a lawyer asserts <clears throat> during the course of a disciplinary proceeding, I, I, I lack capacity to deal with this situation. And, and, uh, a, a complex array of process then unfolds under Title VIII of the ELC. So when these voluntary people who have asked some legitimate questions are sent over to the embrace of the discipline system, a number of things happen that they did not desire and did not expect. A counsel is appointed for them. Disciplinary counsel is assigned to the matter. A disciplinary file is opened in the case. Uh, there's a burden of proof to establish incapacity to practice law. Medical records are needed to meet that burden of proof. It has to go before the disciplinary board for an order transferring the individual member to disability and active status, all of which is labor intensive, time consuming, and not what anyone wants to be doing most Importantly, the member who is seeking a different license status. Um, so this has been a, a known issue for some time, uh, and we've been working on it for some time, hands in hand with the Disciplinary Advisory Roundtable, which, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is a, a, an entity that has been established through a joint agreement of the Supreme Court and uh, the Board of Governors to convene individuals who have a stake in the discipline system to, to address issues that come up from time to time. And we have been looking at this and working on it for more than a year. Uh, and it, it, was, it, it was challenging to come up with a solution that took this out of a um, a heavy rule-based process to take move the path out of the discipline system and create a new path. Um, the, one of the th outcomes we are attempting to achieve is when the, these members who are voluntarily coming forward seeking a different uh, status that doesn't involve payment of a licensing, there's, they don't need to have a public facing status of disability inactive. That's not what they really were looking for in the first place. So how can we achieve that um, objective? And how can we make it relatively low impact to return from the, the new status to active status again when that time comes, because to do so out of the discipline system, to transfer back from disability and active status, again, requires a trip to the disciplinary board and then there's a burden of proof and a, a, again, a heavy lift. So our, our, our objective is to do away with that current process and, uh, and, and achieve something that is more palatable to these members and is administratively, uh, 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 a light lift for um, the reg our regulatory systems. Complexity, simplicity, right? So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we are going to move to you know what we are proposing here. Um, we we are not what we are not doing. I think it's helpful to also say this. What we are not doing is proposing to eliminate the existing disability and active status, right? That's maintained through ELC. It serves a very important purpose and we are not touching that. What we are doing is creating a voluntary pathway that's simpler for members to obtain the relief they need. Um, so the first, just so you know, changing your status is relatively easy and, and quick. It can be done online during license renewal or someone can send a form to my team and we'll change their status, right? What we are proposing then is if someone is facing um, a significant health condition 
we would be creating um, a form, right, that they would attest, an online form, they would attest that they're experiencing a significant health condition, and that's the reason for them choosing to stay in active status. Um, and they would request an exemption of the inactive license fee. That could be done quickly. And, you know, the deadline would be for February 1st, just like the hardship exemption deadline that currently exists for active members experiencing uh, a financial hardship. So they would be declaring that they're experiencing a significant health problem. Um, and it would be processed administratively. We wouldn't be reaching out to disciplinary counsel about that. And it would be... Um, when they are ready to return to active status, there are no additional steps to be taken, right? They would follow the exact same process as anyone who is inactive would follow. So um, we really believe that this proposal, while not perfect, um, it's certainly faster, right? Uh, members can get the relief they want um, by the deadline, hopefully, and not have to pay the license fee. Um, it's less intrusive because we are not asking them to disclose their health condition or provide medical records to us. Um, it provides the financial support that they are seeking and it protects the public because we are going to, you know, enforce the same process to return to active uh, that anyone in inactive status would have to follow, which includes uh, what Bobby went through, all the MCLE requirements to return. Um, so this proposal was presented to DART um, earlier this month, and, um, you know, we have a few people here who are members of DART, and I don't know if um, Governor Williams Ruth wants to weigh in, but it was presented and it was endorsed. Yeah, thank you, Chief Garcia. Uh, so DART is the Disciplinary Roundtable. It is a um, ad hoc it is a standing committee chaired by Justice Yu that meets on an ad hoc basis when um, members of the disciplinary world, including Chief Ende, Chief Garcia, um, General Counsel, uh, myself, other practitioners who, who represent um, applicants or respondents or people involved in, in the disciplinary world um, can ask uh, Justice Yu for, hey, we we need a place to go to have a conversation about things like this. And um, it was a really good, we, we had a recent meeting after uh, Chief Ende was asked to go back and get more information from our, our prior meeting. And there was a general consensus. There were, there were questions, comments, um, people, again, much like this table, debate the potential of what could happen, what would not happen, what would likely happen. The end result was that DART unanimously agreed that, as Chief Andy put it, to not let enemy be the perfect of the good, because this is an amazing proposal that helps, again, the, the few individuals that are impacted by this, that that need another pathway. I mean, again, it's, it's a small sliver of our population and, our, and of our membership, but it's an important one. And again, I personally, uh, supported it because I believe that we have between Director Nevitt and Doug and Hanada, we have people who are in the system that are going to work with the members to obtain the equitable result. And, and I will say that um, the, the objective is to get this in place for this disciplinary system, uh, this not disciplinary system, this uh, licensing um, system that starts uh, this year. And Justice Yu did say that if the board approves this uh, at our September meeting after first read for today, that when transmitted with a note saying, you, this is that thing we talked about, she personally would help make sure the court um, looked at it and, and asked for basically fast track system so it would be approved in time for this year's licensing process. So I would ask us to move this forward and um, and then approve it come September. President-elect Adewale. Um, 
I have a question. Is there anything else we were expecting from this report that would wait September rather than us? Because I, I, is it biology? Okay. Yeah. Um, in that case, I will move to uh, adopt this um, this proposal. Oh, we don't have first to move. Read. It's first read. Okay, we're on track. I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, President-elect Ottawale, for <laughs> that pronouncement. <laughs> for pronouncing and declaring us to be done. Um, however, if there are comments, further comments, I'm happy to entertain them. Um, I will say that if people want to have further discussion, we really do want to break at noon because we have um, the local hero luncheon. So I'm, I'm not trying to cut off conversation about this, but not that you were, but, but I can, but I can. Um, <laughs> that is up to all of you, whether you want to have more discussion. On this? Okay. I do really want to thank uh, Chief Garcia and Diane as always, Chief Garcia gives us clear presentations of really complex itch issues, and um, I really appreciate it. I know a lot of work went into this. So thanks to you, Hanada, and thanks to Doug as well. And all the team, everyone. Absolutely. There. Yes, yes. And um, the team. Sorry, but I'll be back in September. <laughs> Yay. With more. Yay. Yay. We like it when you come back. Um, I think we can adjourn for lunch and we're going to have our local heroes luncheon. So see you over there. <laughs>